Hi, I'm Jess Lee, partner at Sequoia Capital um, and a board member at Winolo. This is Young Kim. He's the CEO and co-founder of Winolo, which is an on-demand staffing marketplace. They help blue-collar workers uh, find jobs and shifts at a variety of different kinds of companies, from uh, places like Tesla all the way to startups like Choose. Um, so the topic we're going to talk about today is creating B2B2C marketplaces. Uh, Young has a lot of experience with that and lots of lessons that he's learned along the way about uh, from Winolo. Um, but before, to kick it off, maybe we can start with, tell us a little bit about your story, which I think is really fascinating, and maybe how it ties to the story of Winolo. Great. Um, thank you so much for having me today. Um, so I'm originally from South Korea, and I came here when I was 15 years old uh, by myself. Um, and this was early 90s, um, way before the days of the internet. Um, and aside from learning the language and adopting culture, uh, one of the most difficult things that I struggled with was to find a job. So if you imagine uh, early 90s, um, you know, no internet, no LinkedIn, no Indeed. Um, the only way for me to find a job was either through local newspapers, there's the job section. So I would open the uh, newspaper and start cold calling for jobs or go down to the town and walk around and just drop into any uh, shops or stores that have the hiring signs on. And um, I remember um, being rejected by a restaurant uh, as a dishwasher because I couldn't speak the language and I didn't look the, look the part. And that experience really stayed with me uh, throughout my career. And fast forward uh, 25 years, um, there has been a lot of innovations in the HR space, uh, HR tech space overall. Uh, but a lot of the innovations have happened for people like you and me, uh, largely white collar skilled uh, workers. But if you look at the underserved, um, you know, non-skilled labor side, which is 50% of our demographic of workforce, um, things have been largely remained the same. Um, if you look at how Amazon hires hundreds of thousands of warehouse workers during the peak season, there's like lines and lines of people just waiting, going through the paper uh, process, manual process, and that's the reality of now. Um, and what's happening on the company side, like companies like Amazon, Tesla, um, they're constantly struggling with uh, getting jobs filled. Um, so why is it that there are so many um, hourly underserved blue collar workers that are not having proper access to these jobs available. And then companies that are struggling to find workers. And the problem of um, that mismatch problem uh, is because both sides are relying on a uh, 60 year old legacy staffing industry, which is about $500 billion. And they haven't changed at all. And everything's manual, uh, very cumbersome process. and that kind of gave us a uh, real passion to solve this problem and really be the voice of uh, underserved blue collar workers um, to help their lives a lot more efficient and better. And that's kind of how everything got started. Very cool. I remember when we first uh, met Winolo, um, the Sequoia team, we thought, wow, this is a huge underserved $500 billion market. Um, it, the product that you're competing with is pretty outdated technology or really pen and paper and phone calls, or in some cases waiting outside Home Depot or in a line to get a job. Um, so the product that you'd built was killer. And the third thing that really struck us was how like mission driven you, AJ and Jeremy have been, how like they still go and do jobs on weekends, which I think is really pretty incredible. <laughs> like Yong has gone and packed meals at the airport um, to serve for you know, uh, the flights that, that many of us take. Um, so I, I love the passion. Um, I also, the other thing that kind of struck me about you was sort of the humility and the, the willing to be honest and down to earth about the struggles of founder life. So something um, you recently wrote a blog post about was how, how much of a struggle it was to, in the early days of Winolo to raise the series uh, seed and the A. Um, and especially, I think, in Silicon Valley, where people tend to be a bit more like, I'm crushing it all the time and sort of feeling the pressure to um, look like you're doing really well. Like You were very honest and very authentic about how, how hard it was to raise money because you were a B2B2C marketplace, as well as various other reasons. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, uh, absolutely. So this was um, 2014, um, and we were just getting started. And 
uh, we were gaining traction. So we uh, had a few initial set of customers and then we had uh, started building out the, uh, the pool of workers. We call them one lowers. Um, and then we were seeing really good traction from the revenue perspective. And from all the metrics that we had, the numbers were looking actually really, really good. So we went to raise capital, um, uh, seed and series A uh, subsequently, and we had a really hard time. So I personally cold called um, about 100 different, cold called and emailed uh, about 100 different investors. Um, the, the, the challenge that we had was that uh, the investors that we met were either consumer focused or enterprise focused. But we are, um, as you can imagine, we are B2B on the demand side. So we are reaching out to Tesla of the world. So we have a sales team that's calling into these companies to bring on these jobs. And then on the supply side, the worker side, it's B2C. So we're a combination of the two. So whenever VCs would talk to us, um, the, the VCs would be either coming from the consumer angle or the enterprise angle. And um, the VCs that are coming from the consumer angle, that they, they would look at our numbers and look at kind of the supply side and say, why is your uh, churn so high? So comparing the best, best in class consumer play, we were not doing well. Same thing on the enterprise side, they will look Keep at- Keep in mind the churn for this category of workers is something like 100% or more every year. Yes, Amazon is like 400%, so they're just constantly churning. Um, so on, on the, the enterprise VCs would look at our business and say, your sales cycle is very interesting and it's very difficult to tell what your CAC is and what your LTV is. So a lot of them would pass. Um, so we had to really find an investor that re that really understand the complexity of the business model, and then the power of what the potential LTV could be, um, and then also really believe in our mission-based nature, uh, where we really wanted to uh, become the platform that can stand up for blue-collar workers. Um, so that part that we, we really struggled, but finally found an investor, but we didn't raise a lot of capital, and we had to be capital efficient. Um, Eventually, when we uh, raised Series A, uh, it wasn't a big round, uh, but we were excited. And we were under a lot of pressure to start scaling quickly. Uh, and we made a critical mistake in that uh, we uh, ramped up our sales headcount too fast. Um, I know some of you have been uh, in the earlier session and how important it is to scale sales in a, a methodical way. But we, we didn't know, so we just hired a whole bunch of reps we didn't have the right support, you know, ops process. Uh, and then we were going after many different types of customers, small all the way to enterprise. Um, and by doing that, we were uh, burning through a lot of cash very fast. And then we were not seeing the results that we wanted. Um, so about six months in of building this huge sales team, um, we were faced with a situation where we were almost running out of money. And then we were not showing enough results to go, go raise more capital. So um, we had to uh, make a very, very, very difficult decision to basically let go of the entire new team that we, have, we had built and go back to uh, this, like basically square zero of uh, where we started with. So we started the year with you know, 15, 20 people. We uh, built up to like 40 and then we were back to 15 and then we had less capital remaining. Um, and the lessons that we learned from there was that um, in a B2B to C uh, marketplace, it is critical for you to understand uh, what the uh, CAC uh, really is and then what the potential LTV is, and then really figure out uh, which um, specific customers or set of markets that you wanna go after and really win it. And when we uh, looked at uh, what really drove our um, unit economics from the LTV to CAC perspective, we realized that it was the mid-market, uh, so not the small businesses, not the large business, but it's really the mid-market uh, that had relatively short sales cycle, but had really strong LTV, and then consistency around using our uh, platform. And that's where we decided to go all in. And, and that was the moment when we started seeing traction back again. Um, and then the second lesson that we learned was that um, when you're scaling really fast, uh, you tend to underplay the cultural aspect of it. 
um, you know, people tend to think that culture is like a fluffy word and everyone talks about culture as, you know, having like a ping pong table or, you know, cater lunch, but it's actually a lot more powerful than strategy or planning um, because at the end of the day, culture dictates how you do things across the company. And unless everyone is aligned on that, it's very hard to do. Uh, so those were kind of the two key takeaways that um, I learned from raising Series A, having to go through a lot of lay layoff, and then having to build back again. And then uh, I think you went through that period of uh, layoffs and finding sort of the, the right customer and really nailing what worked. And then Winola really started to scale. And then I think when we met, that was like 12 months later. Yes. Um, and then so Sequoia came in and preemptively led the Series B. Um, and since then, you guys have been doing great. Can you share a little bit of the sort of the wisdom, the advice that you have for B2B2C marketplace um, founders or just marketplace founders in general? I think you've already shared two things. Culture really matters. Yes. And then know your customers deeply, like which segment and figure out which segment like really works for your unit economics. What other, what other advice or thoughts do you have for Absolutely. marketplace founders? So the, um, the complexity of the B2B2C marketplace is that you're almost building two businesses altogether, right? So you have the demand team that looks like, almost like a building an enterprise or SaaS type um, sales organization. And then on the supply side, you have consumer like growth driven, uh, you know, marketing, you know, growth marketing driven organization. So um, if you have very two different types of organization uh, trying to work together, and then you have the internal ops team that are trying to facilitate the two, um, there are several complexities that can arise from that. So for example, um, let's say that you're trying to hire a VP of product, right? So should the B VP of product come from the enterprise background or the consumer background? It's, it's really tricky, right? So um, same thing with uh, VP of marketing. Should this person have the B2B side of experience or B2C side, more performance marketing or growth driven marketing? Um, and it really comes down to which uh, side really drives uh, the marketplace and where you have the more friction. So in, in our case, um, we are like very much uh, the worker focused. And when we, um, and, and we never deviated from that. And what that translated into the organization was that oh, we would do everything for the workers and that we would bring in a uh, product person that's focused on the uh, one no lower side and marketing person focused on the one no lower side. Um, but initially that thesis didn't work out because um, the reason why one no lowers come to our platform uh, is to find a job. So the way for us to really serve our workers is to bring jobs. So even though our thesis was that we are supply and worker driven market, to so serve them right, we had to put all the focuses on driving the demand. Um, and that kind of resulted in how we do things and how we drive our metrics and uh, building overall organizations. So that was one thing. Um, the second thing is that um, there is incredible aspect of the timing. So um, on the demand side, um, the usual, uh, the typical sales process, sales cycle takes about three months um, for mid-market, uh, you know, anywhere from one to three months. And on the worker acquisition side, it just takes you know, a day uh, to get them through the top of the funnel, onboard them, and then get them start picking up jobs. So you have this timing issue. So what happens is that we would have, start having a conversation. So Tesla, great example. They'll say, hey, Young, you know, we have a serious needs in Chicago, uh, and we need you there. Um, and can you start you know, building up your supply pool? And we'll say, great, we're going to do that. Um, so we will go out and then build up the supply pool in the location nearby Tesla. And it takes about a day or two, maybe three days. In the meantime, um, our sales team is working with uh, onboarding Tesla, uh, you know, the users. And that process just takes a while. So we would have all these workers waiting for jobs to come out. And the jobs are not there. And then they're churning. And then by the time jobs are getting posted and available, we have to go out and recruit again. So there's this constant um, challenge of timing and get to the liquidity perspective point where you don't have to deal with timing back and forth. Uh, there's just like a lot of brute force 
like grid type work that's required. And we have internal mantra around like full core press. And it's just very, very challenging business. But once you get to that liquidity, everything else becomes uh, very smooth and much easier. And that's kind of where we want to strive for uh, in all the markets that we're in. Great. Um, I think we're at, we have about five minutes left. So if anyone has questions, we're going to start taking Q&A. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you think about sort of quality of workforce, especially um, and vetting and validating employees, especially when you do think there's a shortage of quality employees? So yeah. folks couldn't hear that. The question was about how do you validate and vet the supply side? So um, one of, there are many ways to uh, control and solve for that. So um, there, there's the uh, before and then there's the after part. So the before part is that we ensure that the types of jobs that we bring to the, um, the marketplace is very uniform in nature. So it doesn't matter whether you do the job, I do the job, as long as you and I have similar credentials and background and certain traits, then, then we can do the job really well. So we really focused on jobs that would require that kind of labor force. Um, and we focus less on the, um, the screening and onboarding because what we have realized over the years through just combing through a lot of data points is that it's just really hard to predict who's gonna do the job really well. And we see that even in our you know, own recruiting, right? Like how do you know if this engineer is gonna work out well or your salesperson is going to perform even after you go through you know, very uh, stringent recruiting process. It's just hard to tell. Uh, but what's easier to do is once you have seen the uh, worker's performance, then you can make a quick decision on whether this person is going to work out or not. So we focus a lot on the post, like after first job has been done, um, how do we, if this person is really good, and we think that there is a huge uh, LTV associated with this worker, then we will go all in, make sure that this worker feels like they're part of the community. If it's not going to be great, then we have a, um, a process to weed them out uh, in the right humane way. Um, so that's kind of how we allocate our focus. So probably less on the onboarding screen side, but a lot on the post uh, the job has been done. Over there. So what are your primary acquisition strategies on the supply side? Because you mentioned you're having to launch really quickly, responding to the demand signal for a contract. Yes, we, um, so in, in newer markets, so in, in the markets where we are not present, uh, we use multiple different uh, you know, channels. So one is obviously the digital, uh, the traditional kind of growth marketing channels. Uh, the second is we also leverage, uh, you know, Craigslist or traditional job sites. And then um, the third is, you know, we work with, um, you know, community organizations. So there's unemployment agencies or uh, job training facilities that have workers, you know, available right away. Uh, so we would use kind of the three channels. And then once we have a um, certain level of liquidity in the market, then uh, it's, it's largely referrals. So um, words of mouth or referrals through the app. Um, yes? Yeah, um, so you mentioned a lot of the, you know, the workers are blue core, mm. right? So do they know how to use computers? Or said another way, um, so you were trying to use the digital platform to try to onboard those uh, workers. Uh, how do you feel the gap that they don't know how to use computers? Or some of them don't know how to use uh, computers? Yes, yeah, so we on the Wano lower side, we are 100% mobile only. So what we have found is that um, um, about you know 80% of our workforce um, they do not have laptops, right? But they have you know mobile devices, and believe it or not, they're very tech savvy, and and we try to make our onboarding process very simple. Um, so we haven't had the issue of um, kind of the Skills gap. Yeah. Can you comment on some of the roadblocks you ran into trying to get the small businesses to use off? Yes. So um, in early days, we did go after small businesses. Um, and what we have found was that um, 
it it wasn't just the it, it wasn't the right segment for us at the time, and still is is not the right segment. And I'll t- I'll tell you why. Uh, we observed that uh, it takes about the same amount for our sales team to go after smaller customers as as medium sized customers. And when they um, when we acquire a small customer, their uh, behaviors are very episodic, very ad hoc basis, and it's very unpredictable. So the overall size um, of the LTV for smaller customers just wasn't enough to make you know compensate for our CAC in, associated with it. In the future, yes, once we get to certain scale, um, and then once we have really owned the kind of the mid market then we can get into the small business, but the go-to-market strategy will be different. It will be more self-serviceable. Uh, pricing point will be you know, different as well. Uh, but when we try to go to market on the smaller business, the way we were doing, uh, we just couldn't make the unit economics work. Um, and then there was just a lot of um, like hand-holding, right? So we had a restaurant um, that wanted a, a dishwasher. So uh, And then... They they got the dish so we matched them to uh, the Wanola War. Wanola War actually had a great rating, but uh, the restaurant was very picky, and they would can- constantly cancel the workers without even seeing them, and it created very you know much negative you know NPS experience for Wanola Wars, and and this is a very small LTV customer. So um, from that perspective, it just created a lot of friction. So we decided to kind of stay away from the smaller customers and to just focus on what we are really, really good at. Um, so that's kind of where we are. I think we have time for, I think, one more question. Um, So you're asking if they've had to pivot the business model the same way that Upwork has had to. Yeah. So in terms of our business model, um, I think we have largely stayed the same uh, from day one. So our business model is that we don't charge uh, on the worker side. So unlike Upwork or unlike other marketplaces, we truly believe that this should be free for workers. Instead, we go after uh, the customers because they have a big, you know, balance sheet and big pocket and budget. Um, so our pricing is very simple. Um, companies decide on how much they want to pay workers, and then we negotiate on the fee, the markup on top of it. And then the fee, you know, we um, experimented with various fee structures, um, but I, the current structure, which is, you know, just agree on one price, um, that has proven to be uh, working really well. And the reason why we keep the pricing very simple is that it just reduces the friction uh, during the sales process. And yes, we will continue experimenting on how we structure the fee or pricing in a way that it makes it uh, stickier for customers. But so far, our business model has been just based on one fee. Great. Um, I think that's all we have time for. Um, thank you guys very much. And thank you, Yong. Oh, thank you so much. Yes. Thank you.